They're going everywhere around the country trying to find better ways to sue for infringement, even though now two or three courts agree that that wasn't what the, the, the law was created to allow them to do. This is a community-supported legal education channel. Find out how you can support our mission at the links in the description below. So there is a kind of an update in copyright trolling, the kind of cases that I do. So fair warning, this video could be considered attorney advertising. Um, I'm going to show you some articles from my colleagues who have discovered something, and we've discovered it too, and we're all trying to figure out how to respond to it. If you're familiar with Strike 3 Holdings, they are a copyright plaintiff who frequently files BitTorrent-based John Doe defendant lawsuits. They don't know who the defendant is. They allegedly see infringement on an IP address. They don't know whether there's one person behind the IP address or a hundred people or somebody in, somewhere in between. They don't know who the infringer is, but they figure if they can get everybody to answer questions under oath, somebody will have to say, I'm the one who did it. Or someone will, you know, point, some, some facts will fall in a circumstantial way that point to a particular person and they'll be able to convince a judge. After all, copyright infringement is a civil claim. It, it can be a criminal claim, but we're, we're talking about it as a civil claim here. And the claim standard is preponderance of the evidence, which is not beyond a reasonable doubt. If you think of beyond a reasonable doubt as like a 95 to 5% standard, uh, preponderance of the evidence is more like a 50-50 standard. Whoever's evidence and testimony and presentation and law and all that, whoever is more convincing to the judge wins. That's it. There's a little bit of law, procedure, discretion and all that in there, but mostly it's whoever is more convincing. You have to obey the rules, but whoever is more convincing wins. I like to explain it as a tug of war to my, my clients. If if Strike Three Holdings has nearly unlimited resources and they're going to put on an expert witness and lots of testimony and evidence, etc., we have to do all that too in order to beat them because we have to be more convincing. Well, what they have been doing up to this date is filing cases against individual infringers in federal court one at a time to the tune of $400 per case and then requesting the court grant them the identity, a subpoena for the identity from the internet service provider of the subscriber whom Strike Three Holdings alleges is the infringer, is the defendant. Attorneys like me, and including me, have filed motions to quash, have explored motions to dismiss. I'm sure some attorneys have filed motions to dismiss too. Some attorneys have filed motions for a more specific statement, which is something you can do under the rules as well. Uh, rule 12E, is it? And so we've tried to oppose them at the federal level. And you've heard me talk about Judge Royce Lambert and then again Judge Snyder in New Jersey, who have finally thrown Strike Three Holdings out of court, but that was just their court. That was just the one court room, the one judge, and not necessarily a precedential opinion. But Strike Three Holdings has appealed the Judge Lambert decision and will get a ruling next year. And they have appealed already the Judge Snyder decision and will get a ruling in late next year or maybe early 2021. Um, they're likely going to appeal any future rulings that try to make use of Judge Lambert's and Judge Snyder's opinions. But if you were a multi-million dollar company who had this sort of lawsuit scheme going for them and you saw that you were on appeal, well, appeal is one step from not being able to file your lawsuits anymore. If they lose the appeal, that could be precedential opinion or precedential a precedential decision in the Third Circuit or in the DC Circuit and suddenly you can't file your lawsuits anymore. What do you do? You might diversify. And so what they've done here is really clever, really underhanded in an ethical, well, I don't think that this is unethical in the professional responsibility sense. I think this is immoral. Again, I disagree that this is a proper use of the court system. 
and maybe we will be able to come up with a way to fight it. But it's going to be another cat and mouse game where we now have to come up with new legal arguments to fight this behavior. So Rob Cashman from Texas reports that Strike 3 Holdings is now, he says not, um, he, but is now suing in Miami-Dade County for copyright infringement. He says not because that's technically true. They are not suing for copyright infringement. They're suing for what we call a pure bill of discovery. And it is pretty egregious. The Florida Bar talks about a pure bill of discovery as a living, breathing, modern day dinosaur. It is initiated by filing a complaint which seeks relief in the form of discovery. So it is just a filing or complaint or bill or, or motion just for discovery of the, in this case, the infringer's identities. Unfortunately, they are not doing this in a jurisdictionally sound way. Normally, you would file in the proper court. So if you want a Pennsylvania resident's identity, you have to file in a Pennsylvania court. They, Strike Three Holdings, in their federal court pleadings talk about using MaxMind geolocation software to identify the region, maybe not the specific location, but the region, the state and the region of any IP address. So they know where these IP addresses are located, but instead of filing in those states, they file one or possibly one or more cases in Florida asking for the identities to be uncovered. And then that's the last of their claim in Florida. They don't continue to go after a monetary claim in Florida. Instead, they then make demands from those defendants whose identities they uncovered. But remember, they didn't uncover defendants' identities. They uncovered subscribers' identities. And so you, as a subscriber, are suddenly legally responsible in some practical sense because if you get one of these demand letters, you, the subscriber, are responsible for responding. And you might either hire an attorney and have to pay an attorney, or you might respond by saying, I didn't do it, come after me, you know, come at me, bro. And then they get to file a lawsuit in federal court and come after you and you have to respond to that at some point. Or maybe you settle with them. Maybe you contact them and you say, I'm willing to settle my case. They don't have the same restrictions on them. Strike Three Holdings does not have an order from the court saying you are only allowed to use these identities for a specific purpose as they do in federal court. So now they can send demand letters or reach out to you directly. This is, they're no longer bound by the ethics rules from federal court or the protective orders that federal court judges grant. We are now at the mercy of Miami-Dade County Court. And trust me, that's going to be a completely different experience for any defendant trying to defend themselves. They're literally going to have to go to Miami-Dade County Court, hire a Florida lawyer, and defend themselves in Florida court. So this is absolutely nuts. It makes it nearly impossible for defendants to defend themselves. And right now, the defense bar, me and Rob Cashman and Cynthia Conlin and others, we're going to have to figure out how to deal with it. So what do you think of that? I think that's a pretty underhanded tactic. I think that's pretty surreptitious. I think it's pretty low. I think it's pretty trashy as far as... Uh, methods go to try and reach a legal claim. They know that they're not having a lot of luck in the federal court system, so they're going to bypass the federal court system, specifically bypass the thing that they're having trouble with in the federal court system, which is that pre-complaint discovery or that expedited discovery, that early discovery. So now they're going to get the early discovery from a Florida court and then they can sue. Even Judge Snyder said that he didn't have the ability or the discretion to stop them from suing people where they got the identity from somewhere else. So now they're going to get it from Florida court, and then they don't have the Judge Schneider problem. It's clever. It's really clever. It's actually so clever, it's kind of scary. And that's what we're looking at now. That's the new normal with Strike 3 Holdings cases. I wonder if Malibu Media is going to follow the same procedure. Strike 3 Holdings 
lead attorney is Emily Kennedy. I we used to think it was Lincoln Bandlow. He's definitely up there, but I think he's no longer their lead attorney. I think that's Emily Kennedy. And Emily Kennedy is an attorney who worked for Keith Lipscomb in the first Malibu Media Matters. So this is all connected to that one investigator in Germany, Gardele, and that one attorney who worked for everybody, Emily Kennedy. And this this is the progeny of Malibu Media. And actually, Malibu Media was the progeny of the Expendables case, who uh, were, were the Motion Picture Association, or, or the at least the plaintiff owner of the Expendables, sued BitTorrent users for downloads. And that sort of started all of this. That's where all this comes from. So let me know what you think. This is a crazy thing. I think one of the things to bring up, so it's not just that these companies are having a hard time in federal court, so they're trying to move it to state court, um, but the expenses. So if they are asking for, say, 100 people's identities, they might be able to get that through one court filing. Yeah. And so they pay, you know, like $200 and they get 100 people's identities and then they can what feels like extortion, um, not the legal sense, but but what can feel very much like a, a shakedown where yeah. they say, we have your identity, we're going to sue you, we're going to name you. And um, anytime someone Googles you, you know, our our lawsuit for downloading porn is going to come up. And so yeah, Prenda Law did that. To give us? <laughs> the pure bill of discovery is a Prenda Law tactic is a, there was another lawsuit filed. I forget who the, the name of it was. We removed it to federal court, which is something that you can do, but I'm not sure that we ever actually had grounds to. Um, actually, that's not true. One of our colleagues removed it to federal court and we just, we were ready to join in. We filed four or five motions to quash in that thing. And we might have to do the same thing again if they file in Philadelphia court again. Uh, I suspect that that'll be another thing that they will do because Pennsylvania has this same procedure. So if you make a complaint that is for a pure bill of discovery, which literally means the complaint only asks for discovery, that the court's jurisdiction lies in equity, which means you're only asking for the court to do something as opposed to grant a money award. And here we are only asking the court for a subpoena. So that should be in equity. The identity of the parties and their interests in the case. So they're asking for the identity of one of the parties and they've complained, I'm assuming, I haven't seen the complaint yet, but uh, I'm assuming they've complained about BitTorrent infringement, but they've done it in a way that doesn't make it a copyright issue because copyright is solely in the purview of the federal government, which means that copyright is preempted by the federal government, which means you can't sue somebody in state court for copyright infringement, or I can just remove it to federal court and adjudicate it there. But it's not going to be phrased like that. It's going to be phrased like defendants are co-conspirators who have illegally downloaded works and we want to identify them. And that's what the court has granted in a rather large number of cases, I think here. So returning to Steve Vondren's page, uh, he lists the Florida law. So I, I'm not going to list Steve Vondren's page otherwise, but I will list facts from his page and that I can do as a fair use. And they say that specific facts that give rise to a cause of action or defense by the plaintiff and the plaintiff is an actual party, not a mere witness. The matters give rise to the need for discovery. The content of the matters specifically sought to be discovered are in the possession of the defendant. So the identity is in the possession of the ISP. So that's kind of weird. And the plaintiff's right to relief including identification of possible defendants, conditions precedent to maintaining a cause of action and additional causes of action, and the plaintiff's title interest in relationship to the items of discovery sought, and that the discovery is material to the action at law. So that sort of smacks of maybe being something they could get. Um, and so he lists this, the state case numbers here, and there are a lot of them. And so we now understand why there were no cases being filed in federal court because they are now filing cases in state court. So that is scary. They're going to get people's identities from state court and not have to file thousands of cases in federal court. And I'm going to guess, without seeing it yet, that the cases involve multiple defendants, not just one defendant per case. But if they do involve one defendant per case, um, they're not saving that much money. I think they're just bypassing the procedure of pre-complaint discovery in federal court, which is where they're starting to get scrutinized. So they're forum shopping is what they're doing. What do you think of a copyright troll 
I'm going to just use it as a matter of opinion. I'm calling them a troll because look at what they're doing. They're forum shopping. They're going everywhere around the country trying to find better ways to sue for infringement, even though now two or three courts agree that that wasn't what the, the, the law was created to allow them to do. But they're doing it. So if you have received notice of one of these things, you can contact me at torrentdefense.com. My email address is ljfrench at torrentdefense.com. Um, you can go to our website at torrentdefense.com and check it out. We'll be definitely releasing an article all about this this week and trying to, uh, to help clients get through these things for the least damage, least cost, uh, and least aggravation possible. So if you're a victim, definitely reach out to us. It's like you cut off one head of the Hydra and then two more grow back. It's like, yeah. ugh. You know, it's, yeah. like, it's never going to stop. Look at the cat and mouse game we get to play. From a jurisdiction side, does the ISP need to at least be in under Florida's jurisdiction? I, I would think there's a personal jurisdiction argument to be made here. I, I would think that since in uh, many cases that out-of-state defendants are going to have out-of-state ISPs uh, unless the records are held in that state. And even then, you're asking for an identity of a person who's out-of-state. I don't see how Florida has jurisdiction to grant the identities of defendants out-of-state. However, it's not going to be couched that way. They're going to pretend in their filing that they don't know where the IP addresses are located. And so... Who cares that they're out of state? We'll just, we will definitely not sue them in state if they're out of state defendants. But for the purposes of getting their identity, who cares? That, that's what I think that's, the pleading is going to say. That's really toeing the line. Wow. Oh, really? It's like right on the line. I'm, I'm actually impressed with how right on the line it is. Remember, Prendel Law has two people in jail right now, and these were some of the tactics they used. I don't want to connect yeah. the dots and say what they that they did this and this was illegal. It wasn't this part that was illegal. This was more like this is the tactic that mafia style plaintiffs use. So when we say shakedown or we say legal extortion, I'm I'm a hundred percent serious. This is being conducted like a shakedown operation. They want to they want to get maximum dollar from you, or and if you can't pay maximum dollar, they want to know who you are, and then they want to conduct their own research, not on whether you've committed copyright infringement, but whether you can pay them the amount of money they want. Whew, so what do you think of that? That's how copyright trolls work, right? This is like see, this is like serious like organized crime stuff, except it's legal. This is like how organized crime would conduct lawsuits, except it's legal. And I, th I think highly of my colleague attorneys. I just think that they're doing this the wrong way for the wrong reasons. We are lawful masses. You are our lawful masses. And it is our mission to educate you, our lawful masses. I am Leonard French, your lawful masses host. Don't forget that we do have a merch shop. I am now that, now that the dog thing is over, I'm going to get back to making more merch for the merch shop. So let's have your ideas for t-shirts and stickers and things like that. Please send that in. Please feel free to email us at business at lawfulmasses.com or on Twitter at lawfulmasses. That works. Thank you very much for your support. We need your financial support on patreon.com slash ljfrench and sponsors.com slash law in order to keep our mission going, in order to keep paying our people a living wage, if, if we're even paying them a living wage at this point, but we're, we're getting there. We need your help to get there. So we have to grow and we're trying to grow. So please feel free. Please, we are encouraged. You are you are respectfully and gently and lovingly encouraged to donate to us on Patreon and spots us. Thank you to our November fifty dollar plus supporters. Thank you to Joe Tyson, Aspernari, John Steele, Gavin Barnard, Evie, Kyle Mudrock, Michael Pierce, Spirit Bear, Jan de Grey, Daniel Perez, Snore W, Blackleaf, Benjamin Hightoff, and Stephen. Welcome, Stephen, a new addition to that list. Thank you very, very much for your support. And thank you to the $5 plus supporters. We did take some time this morning and those are the right $5 plus supporters scrolling on the panel behind us. And they will be on the crawl in front of me as I'm saying all of this on the outro of the video. 
Thank you to Brandon for editing our videos. Thank you to Tactical for your contributions. Thank you to Joe and Kaylee for joining us in the studio today. I am Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney. I do love you all. Thank you very much for your support. I will see you in the videos that drop. Bye. Buckle puppies. Buckle puppies. Look, do we have three? You can't fit three in your mouth. Haha. -ha. Chase the dogs around the yard with the camera. We will figure out how to get a low angle view. Probably be easier with the Osmo, actually. I should try this with the Osmo. Chase after them. I can get this audio into the Osmo, too.